got to, to set the day we were shooting and meeting everybody and just trying to on my, uh, my costume and everything and then getting to set. Uh, and I slowly started to find things out because there's a book uh, that the, the film was based on, but uh, Catherine didn't want us to, to get the, the book. Well, she didn't want me to get the book. But <laughs> so yes, it was, uh, that's, that's how I came to find out about the Algiers Motel. So I would have never known had I not been a part of this movie or this movie was never made. So you only got the pages that you were, the scenes you were in? I got it sometimes, maybe the day before. But I got, uh, I got, no, when I, when I, when I got to set, um, my first day um, on, on set, I got like everything that I wasn't in. And it was like 30 pages, and I'm like, I'm not in like one of them. And I'm like, dang, Catherine, like am I in the, in the movie? <laughs> like what's, what's going on? And then, um, cause I guess she didn't want us to know if we were gonna die, go to jail, or so like uh, one of my friends, Malcolm, he rapped. Like they, I think they rapped and he went home and he gave me a call and said that he was he was coming back and I was like, oh, you're coming to kick it. And he was like, no, I'm in the courtroom singing with you. I was like, oh, you live? Like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's amazing. And you were never tempted to like look at me yet? No, God. No, I, I, I looked up some things I had to, but they were for my character. Um, I couldn't find a, a picture or anything, but I did find like some excerpts, like what he, he said on the, um, uh, I, I guess what happened after, because he did end up living after. He's not alive now, but he did end up living after. So there were some things that he talked about what happened, and I found out that Jason Mitchell's character and, and my character, we were like best friends. So Carl Cooper and uh, Lee Farside were best friends. So I went with that, and then I used like the, the um, I studied like the music from the time. And so at all times, I was listening to like Marvin Gaye, like Al Green, like Coltrane, the dramatics, of course. So it kind of helped me get into the mindset. And Catherine had that playing at all times on set as well. And well, oh, and before Will Smith, I warn you, he's British. It always throws me off. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm British. Uh, <laughs> Don't be sorry. I'm, I'm British and, and jet lag. That delayed response speaks to that. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I also didn't know about rebellion in Detroit um, and actually embarrassingly I wasn't aware of just how many you know were taking place across the country between so primarily 1965-1968 just how devastating they were the tens of thousands of arrests the, the deaths in the hundreds um, so just to be involved in a project like this has been very educational and very you know informing and um, I feel lucky, you know, to be part of a, a project that draws attention to social injustice and, and uh, unfortunately, you know, bears a lot of relevance to what's going on today. But, you know, I, I am honored to have a responsibility in um, a part of telling the story. Uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And did you get to see a full script? Um, I did get to see a full script. The, the reason being is, you know, because my character is this kind of orchestrator of violence and, and in a way um, controls so much of, of what's going on. Um, it was necessary for, for me to know the outcome of everybody. Um, and I, I think Catherine designed this in a incredible way where she was able to sort of furnish unique experiences for each and every one of us to kind of get the best out of us. I don't know if you guys feel like that. I mean, I feel like your performances speak to that, but um, it seemed like what Catherine was doing was, you know, being very, very conscious of each and every single person's individual journey and then tailoring the way that she directed us to each character, which you know, it is something you can only achieve if you are as talented and as experienced as Catherine Bigelow is. Um, yeah, no, I wasn't <clears throat> familiar with the specifics regarding the uh, 67 Rebellion. I was aware of the unrest at the time. Um, so when first hearing about it, 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 it kind of made sense that this was pretty much the climate in America um, at, that, uh, at that point. Um, Came in early on to do a uh, table read for this uh, before casting it kind of happened. And, you know, Will was there and we were just kind of reading it out so um, Mark Bowl and Catherine uh, could hear it um, and just kind of hear how everything flowed. Uh, and from then it was just, it was heartbreaking. 
it was it was ultimately heartbreaking, you know, finding out about this stuff as we're trying to, you know, give a certain performance so that they could hear, you know, things that would be tightened and that kind of thing. Um, it was really kind of difficult to service that and then also take the story in. So it was nice uh, to have a few months to then kind of come back and attack it. And, um, try to tell you know, a very difficult story accurately. Did you play the same role in the reading? Did you play the film? It was like six different people in that reading. <laughs> <laughs> Did you play all the roles? Yeah, that was, it wasn't a lot of us. Um, because at the time they were still trying to keep it pretty quiet. Um, so yeah, I was pretty familiar with most of the roles. I just didn't know by the time I got to uh, Boston and ultimately Detroit, which role I was playing. I knew it was one of them that I would read, but I wasn't sure which one. Um, and then as I kind of came about and started talking to Catherine about how this character was supposed to represent, you know, kind of all the stories we don't hear about that surround a major incident and that kind of get swept under the rug. Um, it was kind of then that process of that create how do you make this person speak for a lot of those who won't have a voice, and that was the challenge. And uh, you know, you mentioned that she didn't want you to do the book, but what sort of research did you research to do for the book? And how did you get that access? Oh, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, sort of um, kind of um, backhanding it slightly when it comes to accent. Um, I don't know if I quite perfected it, but as Brits, I feel like we're at a disadvantage because we grow up with so much great American media. And from a young age, it's part of the culture, right, to appreciate American accents. Uh, so, you know, I grew up watching Friends, The Fresh Prince of Bel Air, The Simpsons, you know, so we hear American accents from a, from a young age, first and foremost. And, uh, you know, America has dominated much of the media that we consume. So that's the first thing. Um, the, the second thing, you know, to your first point about research, as I mentioned before, it was important for me to kind of educate myself on the socio-political climate of America a little bit, but of course, given that my character's aggressively racist, I also had to embrace ignorance, right? And, um, you know, there are no uh, stats, facts um, that, you know, um, <clears throat> can provide any justification for the mentality of a human being like that. Um, in fact, it's about actually uh, looking at the subversion of reality that informs racism. You know, um, during the time that uh, many of these rebellions are taking place, you know, white attacks on African American people were um, particularly common and regular and uh, they would be stimulated by things as simply as an African-American man looking the wrong way to a, to a white woman. And that's based on the mythology that African-American men are a threat to white women, and that's something that's explored in, in this film, when of course the reality is that white men have historically been a threat to African-American women. So it was looking at um, the subversion of truth and, you know, ultimately the fact that racist behaviors and racist mentalities are built on very ignorant thought structures. And it's quite frightening um, and, and, and shameful to find out, you know, about uh, the intricacies of, of racism and, and, and the psychology behind racism. It's, uh, it's real life horror movie material. Um, yeah, um, one, you know, one of the difficulties with this is, uh, one of the ways this film really shines is from pretty much, you know, role one, scene one, it sets a tone and it stays there. Um, and what was kind of difficult in that uh, was we had a very short amount of time to establish that tone and establish characters that were lovable and you know, all of that. So. As far as research goes, it was just um, a matter of like, you know, how do we make this person something other than their death, although we really just have a few scenes to do that. Um, and, you know, for me with like kind of a comedy background, it was always make people laugh. People love people who like they can enjoy a good laugh with. Uh, so just trying to find, you know, quick places where we could get that in there before, you know, kind of devastating um, the audience with what is, you know, very kind of uh, quick death. Uh, 
And I think that's something that everybody does a really good job of here, is they do a good job of humanizing characters outside of the event. Um, they're not defined by just the incident that brought about so much trauma and pain and ultimately death. They're defined as people first, who then have to go through this. Uh, yeah, for, for me, like I said, I, uh, I didn't get to see the script. Um, I talked to, uh, talk to Will and, uh, and Tyler and, and some of the rest of the cast, so I kind of had an idea of what we, we were doing. But uh, everybody respected what Catherine was doing, so I never like pried too hard and nobody ever told me too much. So I kind of focused on, I guess, the climate that we were in now and kind of to touch on what Tyler uh, was saying, that I was looking at why we become like desensitized to like seeing somebody like kill because like every like you there's a new video put up every day like on YouTube or on the news and so we we're we're becoming desensitized to seeing these people killed and we never get to actually know them and that's why I think that this this film is beautiful because you get to know uh, Algie's character Larry you get to know my, my character you get to know Jason Mitchell's character Carl Cooper before he he dies so you get to see that that. All these people are the same. Everybody's like really complex, and but they're they're human, and so you get to, to fall in, fall in love with them, and so you get to see that when now when we have videos of somebody being killed, you can associate that well this person's human, like they they have a family, like Aubrey Polar had, and they can it's gonna be there at the morgue watching watching his body. So like I looked at a lot of like um, like the stories that were going on, like a Tamir Rice, uh, Sandra Bland, Mike Brown. Uh, I looked at the, uh, a lot of those stories, and I also looked at the, the videos that were st are still up online. And it was that, although it was difficult, it kind of helped me get into the seriousness that of what we were doing, you know. And so that that definitely helped. And then uh, initially, I was like terrified being on set with like you know like Anthony Mackie and Will, like people that that I respect. And I'm like, oh, it's Catherine Bigelow. I'm like, oh my god. And then. Uh, but like just that was the case for all of us. We were all <laughs> at that time. So we all. Yeah, I was the first day of set. I was like, "Yo, Will, like, uh, have you done something like this before?" She's not telling me anything. Just like, <laughs> no, like, don't look at me, bro. I can't help you. I, I didn't know like, what I was doing. <laughs> nobody knew, and she, uh, she would just, she trusted you. So the audition process was, uh, was first of all, like crazy, and then after that, she, she, she trusted you with the part and with, uh, with, with that character, and so. I had to, it was just basically like an acting boot camp. It helped me like, just let go. Like I, I stopped trying to think and I was like, she's, I didn't just to trust my director for putting me in this space. And so we would have like really long takes, maybe like 20 minutes, 30 minutes at a time. And she would just leave you there. Wouldn't tell you when we're cutting. So you would just always have to stay in there. And after a while you just stop acting and you, you become. And so you didn't have a chance that that really helped me. Like I didn't have a really a chance to prepare, but uh, having a, a genius director like Catherine Bigelow, and she does it so nonchalantly, you know, like she doesn't like oh, you can go over here if you want to pay me, but you don't have to. And, you know, I'm like it's Catherine Bigelow. I'm like I'm going over here. <laughs> you know? but yeah, that's that's pretty much how I prepare. Did you shoot? Because um, once you get into the Alton Hotel, it is so relentless and so such an emotional rollercoaster. I'm curious. Did you actually shoot that in Cleveland? Um, did we uh, for the most part we did so like when we were upstairs when I, when like Jason was cooking like the hot dogs it was like hilarious to me um, when he was cooking uh, the hot dogs and we ran the room that was the first scene that was the first thing I did like I landed and I, I heard that there was a uh, I thought we were going to a rehearsal and Catherine was like oh let's why don't we just get dressed and then we get in there it's like I don't know how many people were in the room she was like what do you say we just shoot it I don't know like, I was like, shoot, what? And then like Malcolm was the first one to, uh, to speak up. He was like, Captain, can I get some sides? And I was like, let me get some of those. Let me get some of those too, like. <laughs> and so like, and then we, we ended up just, um, we, we shot it and we shot some stuff and we just found a, a bunch of different uh, things. But then we had like, what, four or three cameras going? Yeah, yeah. At the, at the same time, like Barry, the DP was like a, a, amazing. But like, yeah, we, we shot that and then some things we went back to. So we, we pretty much shot order and then we would go back to something because she's the perfectionist. And she was like, well, I wanted to get like his hand shaking on the wall. So we'd go back and we'd we'll run through the whole scene, the whole 20 minute scene, just to get a hand shaking on the wall, just to make it real. Uh, and I know that um, this last week actually marks the 50th anniversary of the Detroit riots. And you guys actually 
Lee Kelly Castle, uh, who's, and from what I understand, the city really embraced you guys. It, it certainly felt like it. I think for us, um, <clears throat> you know, a big, there's a big sense of achievement uh, in the fact that from our experience, we feel as though Detroit have uh, embraced this story and, and uh, you know, from really the beginning of the pre-production process, Detroiters have had a massive influence over you know, the construction of this film and they've been very generous with their anecdotes, with their information, they open their homes to the researchers and without that we wouldn't have a movie in the first place so it was only right we took it home you know 50 years later and uh, for me the most exciting thing was to come into contact with Detroit police officers um, who now represent the most diverse force in, in America and have them be so affected by the movie but embrace it and um, we were talking yesterday about the fact that James Craig, who's the chief of police um, and uh, an African-American man, he uh, is contemplating making it required viewing for police officers. So this movie, which for us is, you know, amazing and, and we're really grateful to elicit that kind of response. I mean, that, that is amazing because there are some cities Yeah, I, 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 I suppose that, that may be the case. Um, I think what's been really encouraging is to just see the progress that has been made, you know, amongst police departments that, um, you know, uh, are representative of the communities that they, they serve, you know, in terms of um, diversity. And, you know, I think it's now more important than ever that police officers, um, are interested in upholding social justice and you know behaving lawfully and that perhaps they don't take the advice of their uh, chief and come up what, what, what's the official term for donald trump in that respect i don't know but um perhaps they don't quite uh adhere to the um violent rhetoric that he seems to be preaching um and you know while of course this does bear some unfortunate relevance to what's going on today I think we can't, you know, detract from Detroit and specifically the Detroit Police Department, just the amount of uh, progress that has been made. Um, the officers I met seem to be committed to, um, you know, uh, racially unbiased, um, honest, and, um, you know, uh, hardworking policing, and, and that's what we need more of.